Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this is going to be on the SMA. And this is uh, based on an exhibit that was actually at RSNA 2017 by Neville Gordashira and Pam Johnson. So let's get started. And uh, the SMA is something that we do see on every single abdominal CT scan. Sometimes we're specifically looking at it. Um, for example, in a patient with pancreatic cancer, SMA involvement is very common, so we're looking at staging. Sometimes patients have acute abdominal pain and perhaps we're looking at SMA syndrome. Sometimes patients have abdominal pain and we're thinking about ischemic bowel, so we want to look at the patency of the SMA and potential for clot. So there are many pathologies associated with the SMA, and many of them have significant morbidity and mortality. CT is the ideal study for looking at the SMA and helping plan whether patients need surgery, stenting, embolization, or other therapies. A critical part of uh, looking at the SMA, and we've talked about this before, is that looking at the axial images is not enough. You need to look at the sagittal views on every single case, and we've spoken of that in regard to the celiac axis and to the SMA, as well as the spine. And so in this lecture, we'll provide an overview, looking at some of the protocols, looking at some of the role of 2D and 3D imaging. We'll look at some of the conditions that involve the SMA and looking at some of the role CT plays in endovascular treatment of a range of pathologies. So uh, one of the things, of course, is protocols, and we always use thin sections, 0.75 millimeters, reconstructed at 0.5. We love that for doing the... Uh, 3Ds and MPRs. IV contrast is mandatory, ideally 5 cc's a second, but you can get by with 3, but 5 is really ideal. And when we do imaging, if you're looking only at the SMA, perhaps you can get by with an imaging study at 30 seconds, but often because of the various pathologies we're looking at, we're doing dual phase imaging at about 30 and 60 or 65 seconds. I also like to use PO contrast. We use water to distend the stomach. And we do that in all of our cases because it gets rid of many of the pseudo lesions, but also in a case like looking at the SMA and SMA syndrome, it helps to stay in the bowel. And remember that SMA syndrome, you can have a narrowed SMA angle that is concerning, but unless the duodenum is dilated, there's no SMA syndrome. So again, technique becomes very important, and you can see in these two examples. Now let's look at some pathology. Acute mesenteric ischemia. Abrupt decrease in either arterial or venous blood flow to the bowel when undiagnosed or delayed diagnosis, 100% mortality. Things we look for, SMA embolism, thrombus, non-occlusive disease, particularly vascular disease, often involving multiple vessels. When you think about the SMA only, then we're thinking about an occlusive thrombus. Emboli from the heart, for example, can enlarge in the SMA. And it's not just a proximal vessel, but it's often in the distal vessel, particularly near the middle colic artery. Smaller branches can also be involved by smaller emboli. Thrombi often result from rupture of an unstable atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, not occlusive uh, ischemia occurs in the setting of hypotension or cardiogenic shock with hypoperfusion resulting in vasoconstriction. Patients with acute mesenteric ischemia often present with severe abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and diarrhea. A CT in the acute setting demonstrates a thrombus in the vessel with a ves vessel cutoff sign. As I mentioned, it's probably best seen on the sagittal view and often only appreciated on the sagittal view, perhaps in retrospect on the axial views, but uh, if you're only looking at axial, I've seen many cases missed. And here's just a nice example showing you the axial views and then showing you the uh, sagittal or coronal view. And it makes the point that, uh, you know, when you have a proximal thrombus, you probably see it on the axial, but you then tend to lose the vessel or your mind doesn't follow the vessel all the way down. And particularly like in the case on your left, where it's distal, SMA, and segmental, unless you pick up that segment on the axial, you're going to miss it, but on the sagittal, because the vessel's a straight line, it's very, very easy to see. Um, in terms of ischemia, uh, our findings affect management, reversible ischemic changes, including bowel dilatation, wall thickening, mesenteric ischemia. We can see signs of bowel ischemia, pneumoperitoneum. We talk about aberrant anatomy when we're looking at these vessels. 
We look at the length of occlusion, the location of occlusion, and this helps determine whether thrombolysis is the study of choice, embolectomy, stent, whether we're going to interventional radiology or we're going to surgery. And you can see surgery often is the critical study. Remove the thrombus at surgery and then look at the perfusion of bowel. Sometimes the bowel looks dusky, but when you remove the thrombus, the bowel looks very viable. So again, management will depend on the situation. And of course, when we look at CT, we're not looking only at the findings of the thrombus, which you can see in a few more examples here, but we're looking at the bowel. If you only see thrombus and the bowel looks good, there's a good chance that you may not need surgical management. If you start seeing pneumatosis and poor perfusion, then you need surgical management because the likelihood is that the patient is going to um, need surgical intervention with bowel resection. So just a very nice example here. Now patients with chronic ischemia, usually that's related to atherosclerosis, it's older patients, though it can be due to compression by median awkward ligament on the celiac, might be an issue, dissection, fibromuscular dysplasia and radiation are all possible causes. Again, with chronic ischemia, the patients often have multiple comorbidities and so there's a high mortality rate. Often patients present with recurrent postprandial abdominal pain. They may have weight loss due to food aversion, nausea and vomiting, and diarrhea. And usually with chronic mesenteric ischemia, it only becomes symptomatic when two of the major, uh, two of the major three vessels is severely stenotic or occluded. <laughs> and again, what you want to be looking for is wall thickening, the decreased in lumen, the extensive plaque. And chronic mesentery ischemia, as it involves the SMA, most commonly involves the proximal vessel. And we know that atherosclerotic changes, be it celiac, SMA, or IMA, typically involve the proximal vessel. Uh, in terms of uh, treatment, obviously patients with abdominal pain, there are multiple different causes. And so CT is very good at being specific and suggesting that it is chronic ischemia. Again, we always look beyond the vessels, look for changes including bowel wall thickening, pneumatosis, and the like. We're looking at the length of stenosis, transitions, and again, all this information helps determine surgical versus endovascular treatment. And again, in terms of what the surgical options might be, and in terms of what the surgeon will expect to find at surgery. Here's just a couple examples of chronic SMA thrombosis very nicely shown from the coronal to the sagittal to MIPIN volume rendering. And you can see here, it's occlusion of about two centimeters of the proximal SMA. We also talk about SMA dissection, and I have to admit, uh, we are seeing it more frequently, and I am seeing isolated spontaneous SMA dissection more frequently. The most cases are combined with aortic dissection, where the aortic dissection tracks into the SMA. It increases with age, more common in men, and usually in the proximal vessel. With SMA dissection, patients may present with an acute abdomen with severe abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, or at times it'll be an incidental finding. There are several classification schemes. Sakamoto has a scheme of type one through type four. Uh, type one with a patent false lumen with re entry and re-entry which is probably the uh, most common. In terms of things you need to know about SMA dissection, again, usually it's associated with a concomitant aortic dissection, uh, and depending on the length of the dissection, management will indeed vary, whether it's endovascular stent or it's surgery or it's careful follow-up. Uh, again, looking at true and false lumen, particularly the SMA, the vessels often dilate beyond the dissection and you wanna look at patency and flow. And again, the treatment options range from medical to surgical to endovascular approaches. And you can see on the slide here uh, very nicely that is indeed discussed. When you look at the literature, you can see the number of patients treated by modality in each literature review. And you can see that the results are somewhat variable. Uh, endovascular versus surgical seem to be the best results and conservative perhaps the worst results. Nice example here, SMA dissection, well seen on the axial views, but also very nicely seen from the sagittal to the volume rendering. Again, if you're very careful, you'll typically be able to visualize it on the sagittal view 
and the axial view and at times the axial view what happens is that you see a small dissection and then beyond the dissection is focal dilatation which kind of makes you think why is the vessel dilated then you look a little bit more carefully here's another example uh, the section beginning with an asonometer of the patient's takeoff of the SMA and you can see in this case there is no evidence of aortic involvement and another example here we see SMA dissection as well as, as, well as near occlusion of the vessel uh, beyond the focal dissection or in this example aortic dissection with extension into the patient's SMA a very very nice example of this now we also should mention things like SMA aneurysms is the third most common visceral artery aneurysm, about 5% of all visceral artery aneurysms, usually in men, fifth decade of life. Up to half of patients present with a rupture with a high mortality rate. They can be fusiform or saccular, and it's most common in the proximal vessels. Patients typically present with colically abdominal pain and occasionally will present with a pulsatile mass. The most common causes are atherosclerosis, trauma, and then of course we get into things like vasculitis, collagen vascular disease, or fibromuscular dysplasia. When you talk about true versus uh, pseudoaneurysm, true aneurysms are weakening of all three layers without rupture. Pseudoaneurysm is caused by injury to the vessel wall with collection of blood between one or two layers in adjacent parenchyma. And again, it's a range of causes from trauma to inflammation and a range of presentations. In terms of what the physician needs to know, the importance of CT in detecting these aneurysms, which are often an incidental finding, determining the extent, involvement, and whether or not the patient has multiple aneurysms. Patients with processes like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome can have multiple aneurysms of mesenteric vessels. Patients who've had prior pancreatic surgery can have aneurysms. And again, how these patients are treated will depend on the size of the aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm, and then potentially growth uh, of the aneurysm. Coiling can be done. There's a whole different processes, including surgery, but minimal intervention is ideally what you'd like to have. Here's just a very nice example of a patient with Lois Dietz syndrome with a very large SMA aneurysm. That's about as large as it gets. But again, remember that if you're dealing with patients who have various syndromes, this is really what you want to be looking into. Here's another patient with proximal celiac artery occlusion with abdominal pain and evidence of the patient's aneurysm off the patient's SMA. And here's another example of an SMA aneurysm with thrombus present. Again, you can see that our routine use of 3D imaging makes it very easy to detect these aneurysms. Now, I mentioned before vasculitis. Many of the different vasculitis do involve the SMA. You can see circumferential wall thickening, luminal stenosis, and microaneurysms. Lupus is the most common disease process in females and it is most commonly seen in young and middle-aged adults. The CT findings would include bowel dilatation, wall thickening, engorged distal mesenteric vessels, and ancillary findings, including GU pathology. Takayashi's aortitis can also involve the SMA in up to 40% of cases. Giant cell arthritis or polyarthritis nodosa are both relatively rare. With SMA vasculitis, it's important to recognize that this is a disease that involves multiple vessels throughout the body. The most common treatment is with glucocorticosteroids and immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, stenting is uncommon, uh, and usually it's a, a last-ditch effort. Uh, coil embolization can be done for aneurysms, but again, medical treatment is ideal. Nice example here of narrowing of the patient's SMA with wall thickening. The, the first patient on your left has Takayashi's aortitis. Patient on your right has giant cell arteritis. And again, the key thing is looking at the vessels, looking at the narrowed lumen, and then seeing wall thickening. And again, the sagittal views are particularly good in this instance. Now we talk about SMA hemorrhage. GI bleeding accounts for about 300,000 hospitalizations uh, annually. Uh, we talk about proximal versus distal bleeding. We talk about uh, the most common cause of hemorrhage being diverticular disease. The SMA supplies the intestines from the distal duodenum through the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. 
And so causes of GI bleeding that you can see related to the SMA would include angiodysplasias, colitis, or neoplasms. And you very nicely can see the SMA vascular territory on this illustration from the marginal artery through jejunal and ileal arteries to the middle, right, and iliocolic arteries. So some of the things you need to know from a clinical perspective, CT can be helpful in localizing the site of bleeding, the cause of bleeding, whether the bleeding is active or not, uh, the change in the volume of the bleed between arterial and venous phase imaging often gives you a feel as to the velocity of the bleed. We also will look for any type of anatomic variations, which could be important at times of uh, intervention, be it surgical or be it with IR. And again, treatment for SMA aneurysms, endovascular versus surgical treatment, depending on the cause of the bleed and the stability of the patients. Again, ideally these days with bleeds, it's usually going to CVDL, interventional radiology, and embolization, a number of different ways can be done. So let's look at a couple examples. Here's a case of a patient with history of rectal cancer with resection, diverting ileostomy, and now has bright red blood parectum, and you can see extravasation by the ileal anastomosis, very nicely visualized. Or in this example, a patient with sick sinus syndrome and atrial fibrillation and bright red blood parectum, you can see evidence of a right-sided diverticulum with active bleeding. Now remember, our protocols are arterial and venous, and it shows very nicely here that the blood is best seen on the venous phase imaging, though it's seen also arterial. And we get two phases, but sometimes you don't see it on the arterial, you only see it on the venous. Occasionally only on arterial, but not venous. But when you get both phases, you're not gonna miss any of the lesions. Your accuracy is gonna approach 100%. So some conclusions. SMA pathology is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. And appropriate management is tailored to the cause and severity of the pathology. Knowledge of the information that guides management is critical for high value CT interpretation. And we do help make decisions whether the patient needs to go to surgery, whether the patient needs stenting, embolization, and if embolization occurs, what material is used. The key about being able to detect these lesions is multiplanar display, ideally axial, sagittals, coronals, and 3D imaging through a range of perspectives is necessary. At a minimum, you better look at the sagittal views. If not, you're gonna miss a lot of the pathology. Uh, again, radiology plays a major role in detecting these pathologies, which are often silent, or it's a patient simply with abdominal pain and there's no real focal suspicion of SMA pathology. So with that, we give you a lot of references. If you have a lot of free time, take a look at it. And if not, we'll see you next time. Have a great day.